Good morning. I'm Jeff Brown with the North Carolina Center for Geographic Information and Analysis. And we're going to talk about uh, NC parcels today. Thanks for joining us. NC parcels, it's standardized statewide data, complete since 2015, uh, all 100 counties since 2015. Uh, it really relies on county data sharing because the authoritative data comes from each of the counties, from their t tax departments and GIS operations. And the data are translated, uh, the uh, attributes are translated to a standard. So your attribute fields are consistent across the state. Uh, the geometry is as is, as, as uploaded by the county. Uh, this enables particularly multi-county mapping and analysis. And uh, we've had partners on this project. If you want to hear any history, uh, Julia Harrell is here, going way back to a grant uh, with the EPA that got this started. Our working group for seamless parcels began, I think, in 2009. Uh, current co-chairs of that are John Bridgers from the Land Records Management Program and Pam Carver from Henderson County. Uh, <coughs> I also want to uh, give a shout out to NCDOT and NC Agriculture and Com Consumer Services who do cost share to uh, keep this operation running. Okay. So I think, I, I think you've heard the history and the explanations before, but uh, how do you get to the data now? Well, it's through uh, NC One Map for Discovery and Access. There are statewide uh, web map services in REST and OpenGIS form uh, WMS format. There are statewide web feature services for parcels, also in the uh, ESRI Ready and the open source formats, REST and WFS. Uh, there are downloadable zip to shape files by county. There's even a file geo database for all the county records that's updated weekly. Uh, there's also a web application for lookup and display. So that looks like this. I find this handy. It's a ArcGIS online application. You can look up an address or a place anywhere in the state. And uh, I encourage you to try that. That's, you can open that through NC One Map Geospatial Portal. These data are, are updated every weekend, depending on what county is updated during the week. So when you go to a map service, you're getting the latest available as of uh, uh, Monday morning. So we've he heard enough about this, I think, and you're probably familiar enough. I want to talk about what, uh, now that we have a full data set and uh, we can start doing some uh, time series. I mean, we've had questions about time series. I'm comfortable with 2017 as a, as a good statewide data set where the attribute fields are mostly filled out pretty well. Uh, so I'm looking at the change in the number of parcels in a county. Now, pr I, change can occur with uh, properties could be combined into a single parcel. Much more likely property is subdivided into lots for development of subdivisions. Uh, but there can be administrative and mapping reasons that parcels come and go in the uh, collection that's published by the county. So I'm looking at the uh, net change in the number of parcels uh, as a representation of uh, growth in properties with structures. Now, when they're subdivided, they may not have structures yet when we look at uh, the 2018 version of the parcels. But I, I think this uh, is a, a, a decent indicator of growth and change across counties. Uh, some disclaimers, you know, there are multiple dwelling units can be on one property. This is, this is taking unique parcel identification numbers, uh, so there can be multiple dwelling units there that are not really reflected in the numbers. Uh, subdivided lots take different amounts of time, uh, different amounts of time to be developed, so there may or may not be a structure on a, a new parcel. And uh, redeveloped properties, we're not counting those. We don't really have clues about those. It's just the method is really the count of parcels, unique parcel numbers, Parno is the standard uh, field name. Time one was fall 2017, time two, fall 2018. So the concept here is to compute the annual rate of change, percent change over a 12-month period. 
So the statewide results, looking at these two years, uh, total parcels in fall of 2017, 5.3 million. By the fall of 2018, it was uh, still 5 point, almost 5.4 million, I guess, if you round off. The change was 44,090. That's the net change in number of parcels. The annual change percent was less than 1%. It was 0.83% statewide. Or if you look at the change average per month, it's 3,659. Uh, as you might anticipate, the change varies across the state. Uh, I've just color-coded counties here based on the number of parcels, the absolute number of parcels uh, net change per month. So it's uh, some of the data we have is 11 months or 10 months or 9 months or 13 months. It's uh, uh, rated to a 12-month period. So those uh, majority of the uh, counties, the blue areas, had less than 21 parcels, absolute change, net change. Uh, some of the lighter blues there, it goes up, goes up to 68. These are natural breaks that I used, which seem to be about as good as anything I tried for classification into five classes. Uh, the orange and red uh, in the uh, mostly the triangle triad uh, Mecklenburg area, orange, red, and yellow, where there's 68 or more absolute change per county per year. A uh, way to normalize the change across the state, since the number of parcels vary widely from county to county, it's uh, a percent and annual change, percentage change in each county. So this map has a little more variation to it. Uh, 0.82, the orange, 0.82 to 1.41 and 1.41 and above, the red. Those, again, tend to be looking to be uh, what they call that golden banana that goes from, <laughs> from uh, the triangle to the triad down to Charlotte. But there's significant growth out in some of the western counties, too, or at least comparative growth, uh, and southern coast, southeastern coast, quite a bit as well. Areas that still having low percentage changes uh, tend to be the ones bordering Virginia uh, and, uh, on, and, and down east. Highest rates of change, I just did a list of the top 15. For those of you in the back, I'll just read through them. At the top was Johnston at 3.16 per annual percent change, followed by Wake, Forsyth, Robinson, Durham, Union, Moore, Franklin, Cabarrus, Pender, New Hanover, Chatham, Jackson, Hoke, and Green. I don't know if you have had any uh, reaction to any of those, anybody from those counties, or uh, any surprises? Yes. No surprises? No surprises. Uh, Robeson County, there, there was some uh, hurricane damage and so forth. Uh, it might have complicated the numbers there. I'm not sure. Uh, but they did show percentage change in parcels in the top 15. Uh, use the data a, a different way. I, I looked at time two parcel numbers without a matching time one parcel number. So I actually did this in access where the uh, parnos didn't match up. So these are parcel numbers that emerged after time one. Uh, for example, I'm going to look at Union County. Uh, there were 1,801 parcels that were uh, in the set in 2000. 18 that were not in the set in 2017. So I selected and mapped those points uh, to look at patterns here a bit. Uh, looks like these are the pink points. Again, these are the ones that emerged as new in Union County. Many of them are in the municipal areas. Many are outside. I thought I would look at a, particularly at a cluster that appears in uh, Waxhaw. So am I pronouncing that correctly? Okay, so let's look at this area here. I'll zoom in. And these are our parent uh, subdivisions by the parcel points. I should go back to say that uh, 
our parcel data as distributed through NC1 map, it is uh, polygons, of course, but it is also a point data set with the same attributes. The point is usually a center point, but it's somewhere within the parcel for the odd-shaped parcels. Uh, it's definitely in the, in the parcel. So using the points, it can show patterns of uh, parcel development where the parcels are small and the points are close together. So in, in the Waxar area, it looks like we've got some subdivisions here. Let's zoom in a little bit on this area. And I turned the imagery on underneath. This is the 2015 imagery. The 2019 isn't available yet. Uh, but it looks like areas in two, when the imagery was taken in 2015, it looks like much of this area had been cleared. Some of it wasn't. Some of it looks like it was trees. Uh, uh, forested, uh, but the pattern sure looks like subdivision there. In the uh, upper right to the northeast there, there was a subdivision when this photo was taken in 2015 uh, in the winter. So those points weren't there in 2017, but they are in 2018. I'm going to show a mountain example, Jackson County. Uh, Look at that area adjacent to 74, where it takes a big turn. Here. And uh, zooming in with the imagery from 2018, I believe. No, yes, I think this is new imagery. Is that right, Jackson? Anybody from Jackson? No, still 2015? Okay. Anyway, those pink points, we can see them over the uh, terrain. It looks like it's a fairly mountainous area. People building on uh, elevated areas, it, it appears. Scattered, these are larger lots because the points are further apart, so larger lots there. We gotta look at a Piedmont example. This is Forsyth County. Uh, again, the, the new, new parcels as represented as points in 2018 are spread around the county. Uh, I'm going to look at a cluster over here on the uh, east side in Kernersville. Uh, it's area between I-40 and I-74. So get in a little closer. We can see some clusters there that seem to be apparent. If we look a little closer, the orange there is the uh, municipal area of Kernersville, municipal boundaries shaded. So some of these uh, clusters are look to be within the municipal boundaries. I don't know if they've been annexed recently or not, but uh, on, the, on the right, upper right there, that is municipal area uh, jutting out from, it's obscured really by the points. We can look even closer to verify that yes, these appear to be subdivisions. Uh, this, this photo was taken 2018, this is the one I'm thinking of. So the parcels uh, had been subdivided but not built uh, in the winter of 2018. Maybe by the fall they were. Those are the uh, clusters of points over the imagery. It appears that uh, it had already been cleared uh, in winter 2018. And if you look up to the, toward the top there, there was a, uh, residential development there uh, when the photo was taken. And a coastal example, Pender County. If we look down toward the beach, you know, you figure things are probably already built out uh, near, the, near the coast. Well, not exactly. Uh, there's still some new parcels subdivided between 2017 and 18. Uh, the beach is down in the lower right there, the shoreline. But uh, if we look at this area uh, just to the southeast of Route 17, get in a little closer, uh, it looks like further subdivision of areas that were, looks like tree covered or maybe sandy areas. Uh, those have been at least subdivided by fall 2018. This is 2016 imagery underneath showing, uh, you know, 
some vegetated areas that had not been built out. So it was just some snapshots looking around the state, uh, and I feel like I'm just, just gotten started. I, I think there is interest in time series. I know uh, Greg Cox in the earlier presentation was showing his parcels that he's collected uh, in, in areas over, over many years. Uh, but I think we've got a pretty good set starting in 2017 for comparative purposes. You know, a five-year period would be, would be a better comparison. than just a one-year snapshot, uh, you know, one over one year in a certain year, there could be uh, things happening that uh, could affect the pace of development. A five-year period would be, would be better. So at least we've got a baseline we can start building toward. Uh, other things, you know, could look at from the data. Uh, there's a standard field for parcel value, total parcel value that's filled in by all the counties. Uh, but looking at a trend for that, I think, is a little perilous given how reappraisals occur every four to six to eight years. I think you're going to get some uh, wide variation uh, depending on what years you choose for parcel value. Another thing we could look at is uh, parcels by size range. The smaller, the tighter the part, you know, under one acre parcels, those quarter acre parcels or half acre tend to be residential development. In general, uh, you could look at size ranges like that and get a sense of what uh, what parcels uh, over uh, several acres are still available in a county for economic development per economic development purposes, land development purposes. Uh, another way to look at the data, perhaps, is building value per acre. Almost all the counties have building value now as one of the standard uh, fields that they populate. I saw a poster in the poster session that was doing a 3D analysis of building value per square foot, or no, it was per acre, I think, building value per acre. So there was a lot of, you could see sort of a 3D representation of where the higher value uh, properties were in terms of building value. Uh, we have a field in, that's populated for almost all the counties on uh, parcels with structures of some sort, you know, some threshold value uh, for building value. You, know, you can color, color code uh, points for that or color code the parcel polygons or something like that. Um, so I, I think there's some possibilities here as we gain more years of uh, full, full state data uh, at least twice a year for counties, which is the goal. But I'm going to show you what I think are the most uh, promising or, or most useful fields, the most useful standard fields that we have in the data sets, uh, it, from what I've seen in my experience, is parcel number, GIS acres, improvement value, land value, <coughs> excuse me, mailing address, owner name, parcel use codes, and parcel use descriptions. These are, this is still probably the weakest part of the data set looking across the counties. The descriptions of what's on the parcel or the land type or the building type uh, still not fully populated across the state. Plus, it's not, in, uh, it's not consistently described from county to county. I think there's some future work to do there. I know there's appraisals work in different ways in different counties and those parcel use descriptions are uh, really informing the appraisal process, but I think there could be some standard ways to describe residential, commercial, industrial, and those sorts of uh, parcel uses that would be valuable for many use cases. And then parcel value, total value, that is, sale date, site address, number of structures, uh, structure year of construction. I think those are the most <laughs> useful fields. Julie, do we have time for any questions or? A couple minutes for any questions or comments? Yes, uh, hold on, for the recording. Thank you, so just, just about the time, is that the construction time, when you look at the, the change, that's the, the time, it's the construction time? Okay. Construction time. He's wondering about the time, no, it's, uh, 
the parcels are coming in the tax department in the land records when a parcel is changed you know the county has I mean, parcels cover the whole county there's all it should property you know that covers the whole county but a change can occur when a parcel is subdivided into new parcels let's say it's a 10 acre lot that's subdivided into 20 half acre lots so each of those new half acre lots has a new parcel number the old parcel number is retired I, 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 right they may be retired <laughs> okay but uh Oh, that's a good question, but yeah, it's it's it doesn't matter. It, it may have been may not be constructed yet. It's just subdivided, and it could be constructed. It's more suitable when it's subdivided for residential development. It's not a construction date. Yes. Oh. I was curious how this um, process handles like condominium development, so uh, high density multifamily, which seems to be a lot of what's occurring um, in the urban landscape. Ouch. <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, if, a, if the uh, condominium development has a single parcel number, I guess it depends on how it's recorded or in the land records. If it's a single parcel number, that's just one up here in the analysis that I did. You know, there's probably more sophisticated ways to do this. And uh, I'd look for... I was just thinking it'd be kind of neat to see, um, to represent that density in like a hotspot type uh, function, spatial analytic, uh, where, which might show you those large uh, density areas that are only represented by one coincident point. Right. So we're looking for residential household density. Yeah, that's a great point. Oh. Uh, do we have time for two? <laughs> Rich and then Greg. I, I just wanted to respond to the question about the condominiums because uh, it really depends on the county. Some counties actually represent the individual condominiums with little tiny polygons subdividing the 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 uh, the, uh, the building uh, perimeter, and then other ones use a one-to-many relationship where you have a single parcel polygon with multiple condominium units with ex you know, extensions to the parcel number. So yeah. it's going to really vary. It's going to vary by county as to how they apply that. Okay. One more. <laughs> Two quick things. Uh, Jeff, I don't think you have any, well, you probably do have exactly an idea of how important this is. Uh, in Mecklenburg County and the Charlotte region, we're just growing like crazy, and schools are inundated. We, uh, they've not been good predictive tools. Uh, uh, to the point about the condominiums versus townhouses versus whatever, I actually just did this exact study on everything south of Highway 51 in Mecklenburg County for a client, and there's some math we can play with that you parse out in the specific case of how Mecklenburg County's database works that you can uh, you, you get some very different numbers by parcel count, by, by value of different things, but we talk about that. But, but an important thing that I think needs to happen at a, at a state policy level is, is recognize the food chain of growth, particularly in these high growth areas. Uh, those parcels started happening when rezonings or subdivisions were submitted and, and, uh, that the one in Union County, I'm very familiar with that one because I was involved in it. But um, they that one actually got done in around 2003, all the approvals, and then we had the crash. And the food chain is you get your you get your 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 site plan approved. You get if you need to rezone, you rezone it. You got a site plan approved, subdivision ordinance, you're all done. And in that case, that was a about an 1,800 unit development. So you don't go develop 1,800 units at once or lots at once. You phase it. And uh, for tax purposes, you keep the large parcels large because you don't want to have to pay for, for, for developed parcels that don't exist yet. So you see this food chain. There's 1,800 unit Hit the system. You know they're coming. And then you can predict, uh, bearing, barring any, any um, economic downturns or whatever, why does that matter? School systems get inundated, all this kind of stuff. At a policy level, uh, we need to talk about uh, 
coordinating with planning departments and let them send that data in. Now, now I do that in studies that are much smaller. Statewide is going to be a lot more probably problematic. But that's, that's the true way it comes in. We'll talk. <laughs> oh, one more? One more. Oh. <laughs> so have you um, begun discussing with the uh, floodplain mapping about uh, linking this statewide data set to their building footprints data set to do further uh, structure value analysis? And That's a good planning? question. Yeah. I, th I, I think they are utilizing it already, but... But yeah, uh, putting I mean, building footprints and uh, yeah. joining the information from the it process. available more widely than in yes. the floodplain mapping. That would be good. Thank you so much.